Today I have the privilege of uh, introducing an ex-prisoner of war, Harold Tostad from the Mayville, Portland area. He was in the Army in World War II between 1940 and 45, prisoner of war for a number of months, and uh, he was uh, distinct in one way. He fought in the, in the North Africa campaign against uh, General Rommel, and today we're, we're visiting with him at the University of North Dakota, the Aerospace and Science Division. They have a studio here where we're visiting about his exploits in World War II. So, Harold, you just go ahead now and tell us how you, how you won the war, see? <laughs> okay. Well, I went to service in uh, 19, September 25th, 1941 and did my basic training and the other training at uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And we, uh, I had a f f short furlough before we left. I bought for five dollars from a guy from Washington State. And, how'd, you, uh, how'd, you get, how'd you buy that furlough? Could you explain well, that? Well, they didn't have enough, they didn't have enough uh, furloughs to go around for everyone, so they, had to, they kind of drew out of a hat and you do a number, whatever number you do, or, or whatever state you do, your own state, uh, you what, got a furlough, and the other guy's got a zero, and I got a zero, and he got a, there were five day furloughs. So you couldn't, transportation those days were trains or cars, and you couldn't go to Washington State from Fort Knox, Kentucky in five days. So the captain, he said, you can do whatever you want. If you want to sell it, you can do it or give it away, whatever you want to. So that's the, I won't even know you do it, he said. So we, he, I bought, paid him uh, $5 for it, I think. And we rented a car in Louisville, Kentucky and drove to Fargo and, and there we dispersed. My folks came and got me there and all in all, we left on a Wednesday, so we got made seven days out of it. We got back to, we had to go get back to uh, Fort Knox on, I can't remember what day it was, but anyway, we spent Christmas at home. And I wasn't home again for three years, I suppose, about. We got back, then we were, we were uh, put into our, our, into our regular outfit that you're going to be in for a duration. And I was, Fort Knox was home base for First Armored Division. And I was in uh, the 16th Armored Engineers Battalion, First Armored Division. And that's where we got transferred when we got back to camp. Then we, uh, that was after Christmas, and then in, I don't remember for sure, it was probably in March or around Easter time, they shipped us to Fort, to Camp Kilmore, New Jersey. Fort Knox, no, no, Camp Kilmore, New Jersey. And we stayed there for, uh, there's our embarkation point. We drove there and I went there in an army convoy. It took us about four days, it took about 80 acres of land to bivouac that whole convoy. And we, was, we parked all our vehicles on, on a parade ground at uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. We stayed there for about a couple of weeks, and then we were put on a train and shipped to Boston, Massachusetts, where we boarded a ship. And that's when my overseas time started about, I think it was about the uh, 13th or 14th of February. I was on board ship. And from there, we sailed to Nova Scotia and met up with a convoy. And then from there, we went on to Belfast, Ireland, where we landed on the 11th of June, 1942. I remember that happened this morning, really. Couldn't understand those Irishmen, though. They were pretty tough to... And we, we were stationed there at uh, a little town by the name of Kilkeel. I can't remember the name of the base, but the village there was there for well, most until about we got there in June. We was there till about in uh, 
October, I guess, maybe, somewhere. What did you do then while you were there, all those oh, three, just four months? Training, and marching, and, and uh, doing just like I did in, in, uh, back training. in, yeah, racing training. I always walked, and every day walked about 10 miles or so, so you could stay in shape for, wouldn't lose all your muscles. And then we, uh, that was in Belfast, North Ireland. And then we, they, I was on a, a assistant driver for on a half track, so I and a driver took, we took our half track to ship them all to England uh, via ferry or whatever. We didn't see our vehicles till we got, we went in the ferry across from Northern Ireland to uh, to Scotland, a little town of Scotland. We stayed. Bivouac there, and that's the first time I eaten oxtail soup. It was made out of tailbones, like the oxtail soup sure. it says. And uh, then we uh, got on a train with our half track and went to into, went to Liverpool. We did. We did. There was a camp there in between Liverpool and uh, Manchester, about halfway between those two towns. And we were there for about. Three or four weeks, I guess, or three weeks, I can't remember exactly. But we, and then we shipped out from there and went to North Africa. Got on board a ship in Liverpool, and uh, that took about, I forgot to mention, it took us 17 days to cross from the USA to, to Ireland. Was that in a convoy? Yes, yeah. a slow, slow convoy. Did it zigzag? Zigzag back and forth, or did it go straight? Know. I don't know what it did, but no. it went slow. I don't know how many ships are on, probably 15, 20, I don't know. Well, I flew, flew over those convoys for some time there, you know, patrol. Had uh, maybe a hundred ships in them. What a mass of ships, and yeah. you know, they... Okay, well, go ahead. Well, that, that, when we got, we got another convoy in, in uh, when we left Liverpool, and that was... Uh, Really a big gun. Well, there was about, they said 1,500 ships. As far as you could see, it was ships. And like they say, it, uh, you can see out of the ocean about 25 miles, then you're, you can hide a whole armada because of the curvature of the earth. And that kind of was proven to us, too, because on that convoy, uh, that was the first convoy. Uh, we saw a thing sticking out of the water. We thought maybe a periscope or something, you know, didn't know any better. And, and what it was was the mast of a battleship. It was about nine o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock in the afternoon that convoy passed us because our was going so slow. But after it left Liverpool, and, and, and uh, like a battleship, you know, the, the mast on a battleship must be 80, 90 feet tall, high, and that whole convoy was hidden from us in the morning at nine o'clock. And they passed us in the afternoon. But we got into uh, this big convoy that went to, went to Africa. That took 15 days to get across to Africa. We were in a storm for three days, and it was horrible, that storm. The waves were like, well, I call them hills and valleys because they, the waves must have been. When we docked in, in Oran, uh, I looked up on a, on a station where I was on a gun crew on that ship. And it was on a bridge's deck floor, on the, vid, on the bridge, and that's one of the, about the highest place on the, on the ship. And I would say that was at least 40 feet above the water, above the, the shore, the, the dock. And out at sea, you couldn't uh, see ships alongside you. And the convoy, the ships traveled in rows, about a quarter mile apart. And they're about six, seven hundred feet, or rods maybe behind, or be, behind each ship. Between each ship, but you sometimes you couldn't see the uh, the ships alongside if there were water in between. So that's when I say the hills, and they're really hills and valleys, and the ship would just ride over the wave and then go to finally dive itself into the wave and come back up again. And that was for three days. We was in that convoy, and then we. Uh, uh, they, we got, got on trucks and on train. We, we, this, we landed in Iran. We got into the Mediterranean Sea. That's in Africa now. That's Iran, Africa. No, yeah. Iran is in North Africa. 
in the Mediterranean Sea. Was it hot there, summer? Or? No, we were there. We, we got there in, in December. And the nights were really cold. We'd, we had uh, a Christmas Day dinner was uh, out the, on the wide open spaces there. And the longest child line I've ever seen, about a quarter mile, a half mile long, maybe that child line was. <laughs> but we had chicken, or turkey, chicken. Turkey, I think it was. But the, the nights in Africa were terribly cold. There was no snow, but it was raw and wet. And our pup tents, we slept in pup tents all the time. And, and uh, it was sagebrush and not so much sand, because we were in the northern part of the desert, you know, North Africa is. But we got on train at, at Oran, and then we went, took us two, three days, I think, to go up towards Tunisia, where we were. Fayed Pass is where, we were, where our battles took place. And uh, that's where, uh, where we uh, were most of the time. But some of the towns was, I uh, can't remember, I was never really in a town, so. Sabitla was a town not so far away, I guess. That was on the coast, I think, of the Mediterranean. Were you very coast. far from the coast? No. No. That was our mission, I guess, was to try to to form a... That's when we were taking prisoners. We were supposed to hold off Rommel's forces. We were coming... They were, they were licking or they were forcing Rommel back. General Montgomery, the English army, was coming out of Libya. They'd been fighting for years and years, you know, three or four years by that time. And, uh, but we weren't able to, to cut them off, so we got surrounded and by Rommel's forces. And uh, that's when I was taken prisoner, not right away, but I don't know if I should tell you about when I was, where we were when I was taken, we've been, we've been, we split, when, when they, got behind us and surrounded us away. Our office got all split up and there was about 150 of us in a group and then later on we run up uh, up and against the machine gun nest and we were shot at and separated again. So we finally ended up because there was just uh, 13 of us walking. We picked walking up... the sand there or which way were you going? Forward or back? Well we were trying to go back to our own forces. You can see uh, the German forces were about a half a mile away. We were alongside them, they didn't see us. And the terrain there was kind of a little uh, foothills, kind of like the, oh, it wasn't as hilly as the Badlands here in North Dakota, but uh, but we had, uh, we didn't want to travel in the, in the daytime for fear of being seen. We'd only walked at night, and we walked for a long, long time, for many miles, and, and, uh, So we, we, we laid up that morning in a, in a little old shed. Somebody said it was a grain bin. That uh, for, I don't know where they raised the grain there, but anyway, that's what they say. They said it was the Arabs. All of you guys? There was just 14 of us, yeah, yeah. in that building, and we were going to stay. We had a way out, but uh, an Arab walked by there in the morning, and he saw us in there, and he reported us to Germans. The Germans were about a half a mile away from us and and uh, he must have told them because next thing we did we didn't even have a guard outpost guard out because we were scared he'd be seen too so we should have had a guard maybe we could have gotten away but by the time we first thing we know there was a German standing in the door with a hand grenade above his head they only just to drop it in there and finish the rest of us off too but so that's the day we were captured and we get outside and there must have been a company or two of Germans out there. So you didn't have a Chinaman's chance. That's when we were taken prisoner. Then we took, uh, they hauled us that in trucks. I don't remember what kind of trucks they were, but they, because they were so short of equipment themselves. You know, the Germans were, uh, well, I read a story, this Mein Kempf book, and I read half of the book and I threw the rest of it away because I, I knew the rest of the story anyway, you know. 
And uh, no use for me to read that. And But the Germans were pretty meager off it at that time. They were short of supplies and food. And from what the Cornish book, the, their soldiers too were short of food in Hungary like we were. We walked for about 100 miles, so I think, in North Africa before we got taken prisoner. And uh, uh, what happened after you're taken prisoner? What did they take you? Did they feed you, or what happened then? I don't know. When I don't remember ever being fed, you know, except in Italy. Well, we were taking, we were uh, they hauled us back to their main headquarters, then we were ter in the interrogation there. They interrogated there. And they took your everything you had off. We didn't have any identification on us at all. No pictures, no nothing except oh, they gave us a name and serial number, but it was a pretty scary place anyway, because they threatened if you didn't tell them the truth, why, or tell them who you were and what office, why they could, would probably shoot you, you know. But we never, I never said anything. I just they finally went back out in the ranks, and then they loaded us up on a truck. They took us in a truck from where we were, we were actually taken taken prisoner to. Uh, this is now in the, uh, in Tunisia, Tunis, or I think it's a country, a state by name of Tunis too. Yeah. It's a town, Tunis too. But Tunis is uh, you've already gone through uh, Tunisia when you get into Tunis. So we weren't very far from Tunis, I don't think. But then they hauled us, and then we, it must have been from Tunis where they, they flew us to Italy, because Germany still had control of Italy at that time. And, uh... Well, they load you right on that plane, that JU-88, or what, what was the number? Yeah, that? that's, it's a JU... 52, maybe. JU-52. Yeah. The tri-engine. Three engines, yeah. It's like, a, it reminded me of the old Ford tri-engine airplane. Tri yeah. yeah. And, How uh, far was that flight? Uh, several hours. Over the Mediterranean, sea, yeah. Over the over the Mediterranean Sea, from from Tunis to to Naples, I think is yeah. where we landed. We bypassed Sicily. We didn't land in Sicily. And you were asking about food. I don't remember a single time we ate. That time, no. Several days had passed, and uh, just the food we did take was take with us when we abandoned our place was. We blew up our vehicles, so the Germans couldn't hold, get hold of them. But we took out the little food we had and we carried with us. And we walked for 100 miles for taken prisoner. And this Ju-52, uh, but I remember so well. The pilot, what well, the pilot on, had gone to school in, in, uh, I think it was in, he was in Pennsylvania, at some school in Pennsylvania. And he uh, was trying to talk English to us, and we did talk English too. Yeah. But I remember the cockpit, and I see those two guys, there's two, pe two people in that co -pilot, a pilot and co-pilot in that cockpit. When it stuck out the window, which they weren't supposed to have in the first place, because this was a transport plane, and uh, they used to haul supplies one direction and people out the other direction towards Italy. Because I guess their docks and stuff were so bombed out that they couldn't uh, get in there with the supply ships very well. But they couldn't haul very much stuff in those little airplanes either. Because they were big airplanes, but they, the load capacity was pretty small, like 18 passengers. And that's the only time we weren't crowded with us when we were in that airplane. But we got to Italy and we were there for about two weeks. That's when they cooked some soup. I remember that soup. Because I think they just went to the, along the road someplace, pulled the weeds and boiled them, and that's what we ate. It was terrible stuff. And I had just diarrhea that you would never believe. And uh, then they put us on a train and shipped us. We went to Munich. Their trains Munich, Germany. Munich, Germany, yeah. Well, Stalag 7B is where the... The, according to the map, uh, one map I have at home, uh, Stalag 7B was, uh, <coughs> was uh, 
at the town of Minigan or something was the name of it. But I remember going to walking through uh, Munich though, because they had so many statues along. Then they had a kind of a canal going, the streets and on uh, each side of the canal and it's a waterway there anyway. And so many statues that uh, they looked almost like live people standing there. We was, was there for a couple of weeks. Then they then they shipped us to uh, Stalag 5B by Friedrichshafen. They were building something. I don't know if it had to do with uh, atomic energy or not. Bef before this, in Germany, we when we when no, oh, this after. And we were in, we were in, it's this place. It seemed like to be, it seemed like it was a. Uh, it's completely new. They're putting in railroad and electrical and they big electric cables like we have here. They don't for for all their uh, electricity and and uh, the uh, it never got to be operate. It never it got to be operational, but it was never used because uh, we tried to do a little sabotage work while they were building it. Because I was on the railroad gang, so I couldn't do much sabotage because. Everything is above ground, but some of those guys that were on the crews were. This is after they made us Arbeit commandos, they called us. And uh, where were you living then, when you when you were working on this railroad? You lived we in were a camp in or Stalag Five B then. Oh yeah. No, was we that, moved to Stalag Five B. Was that a big camp, or how many how many prisoners did they have there? Well, I don't know how many. There was just a big camp there. Probably. A couple hundred or yeah, something like that. Yeah. And we stayed there for. I was there for about. I believe uh, two, three months, I think. And you were working on the railroad? Yeah. And you were building this thing and did concrete, big heavy concrete and the bolts, big bolts, and they were only about an inch apart and they might, I, I was guessing it's something to do with atomic energy, but it was, those bolts meant to be old, so it had to be something really strong because the way they were, the bases were put on there and the foundations and stuff. Anyway, I found out later it was blowing up, though. They never got to use it. And we was there, and then we shipped us to they shipped us to Stalag 2B. Now, 5B is you can see the switch Switzerland from there. It's in southern Germany. Yeah, we're in southern yeah. Germany. You can see the this Lake Con Lake of Constance, it was called, and uh, you can see that uh, the. Uh, Helps from there, and that was free country, you know. But you yep. could never get there because it was all. This is the winter time. We guarded pretty close all the time. All the time, night and day. And when we, uh, the train we got on, that's when they really packed you in. And their railroad cars are about half the size. They're like our old Ford and Eight you see it in Legion. Yeah, that's the kind of the cars they were. And there was, I suppose, forty people in there. Everybody couldn't sit down at one time. Somebody stood and somebody laid, and dysentery. And whenever you had to go to use the bathroom, you just they train stop. It looked like when you've seen, if you've seen that uh, that movie, uh, Schindler's List, yeah. where the boxcars. I want to look at you too. <laughs> I've told it in the story before, but uh, uh, that's about the way it was. Everybody got off the train and on the siding and the guards were about 10 feet apart and, and uh, whatever you had to do you did right there on the, on the right of way. I don't know who cleaned up after us but because there were lots of dysentery I'll tell you. And uh, we finally got to Hammerstein. And like I say Stalag 5B was in southern Germany you could see the Switzerland from there and they bombed that one night. I forgot to tell you about that. They bombed that one Sunday night because in 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 uh, Friedrichshafen was a big building. They had a they had transferred or uh, remodeled it to making uh, submarines there. And I was told that the submarines could be after finished they could sail them down the Rhine River or the river down to into the Mediterranean Sea and get them out to sea that way, out through the Mediterranean Sea. And and that's what I was told. I don't know if they were not. That, and there's a uh, Many, many years ago, it was at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, there was a Graf Zeppelin that came from Germany, and they uh, had burned. It was built there in that town, that was. 
That's why I remember it too. But it, uh, I don't remember the town. I was in that town. I had, get my, I had a toothache in there, and the dentist pulled the two of my teeth back here on, the, on this side. Do you have Novocaine? I had Novocaine, but it didn't work. I was out of the office before Novocaine had started to work. <laughs> I could still. That's why I tell the dentist. And I go to the dentist in Fargo at the VA hospital. I tell them, <laughs> Dr. Hagen, I say, I'm trying to be gentle. I say, I can't. Well, don't hurt me as much as that dentist did in Germany. I tell him, and he laughs about that. And, but uh, that because that, that town wasn't very far from that Stalag 5B or that camp that the thing they were building there. It's about eight kilometers or so. Then where'd you go? Then we got on a train that shipped us to to Stalag 2B in northern Germany, northeastern Germany. Towards Poland? Towards Poland, yeah. I think on our maps, uh, Hammerstein, I can't even pronounce the Polish name, but... Uh, you weren't near Warsaw or Stettin? Well, see, yeah, we were east of Stettin. East of Stettin? Yeah, towards Russia. Yeah. And we was there for, we was on that farm for 18 months. You must have had a long train ride up there. So long, yeah. Took us a week, I think, to get there. And uh, that was a terrible trip, boy. And we, then they worked us, put us on farms. This farm belonged to the king of, uh, of Germany's uh, descendants, I guess. King Wilhelm. And we worked on that farm. We was there for 18 months. Uh, they, uh, there was a Sixteen of us there, so we were actually better off working because we, we you didn't get any more food except what you could steal. You could steal. Uh, there wasn't much you could steal either, but we did get Red Cross parcels after about ten months, so it hadn't been for those, it would have been really, really tough. Well, you live in a barracks of some kind, or we lived in a. There was a section of the, of the, the manager of the. The farm manager, Hofmeister, they called him in German. And uh, there was a wing, but we had, we had that part of the house, and that had been remodeled into barracks, you know. And it was fenced in. in bunks or shelves? Yeah, or? Bunks. It was straw mattresses. Yeah. And fleas and lice. And how'd, you get, how'd you get along with those fleas and mice? Pretty good? Well, you, you, can't, kill a, you can't kill lice anyway, except when. <laughs> You can boil them, and you still can't kill them. <laughs> you can't. It's terrible. And the fleas, of course, bite you. <laughs> and, uh, what time would you go to work in the morning, then? Or did they get you up, or what? what did yeah, they, call I think we got, yeah, we had a roll call about, we got up about 7, I guess, in the morning, and went to work at 8, or 7.30 or so, 8 o'clock. And they roasted you up because you're locked in every night under lock and key. It was uh, out around the outside was barbed wire, and netting fence outside and the door was locked with the iron thrown over there. Were there any other camps like that around where you were or were you the only one? No, there were some closer. We never, they never did get acquainted with them. No. Some were, this friend of mine, Donald, Donald Peterson, he, uh, after I talked to him, meeting him 50 years after the war, why, he wasn't very far away from where I was. I was on his farm for 18 months. And they, had, they raised potatoes there and sugar beets, and there were 70 milk cows on that farm. Some of the guys were on the milk, on the, worked in the cow barn, and some of the, the rest of us worked out in the fields. What kind of work would you do out in the field then? Just, uh, they raised, uh, they raised uh, sugar beets and oats and mostly rye, little wheat, mostly rye. Cabbage? No, turnips? No, no. What did you do, hoe then, or just uh, all general farm work? Just, just general farm work. Yeah. And they, uh, everything was by pitchfork. They didn't have anything to... They had two tractors, one tractor diesel, and then one tractor was a wood burner, if you ever saw those or not. Yeah, I, I was familiar. I had driven a, a truck. Yeah, the truck had them. Wood burner. In Europe and uh, all over Europe, they had those kind of yeah, they trucks. Yeah, they were from the it gas, was, yeah. yeah. That's kind of odd. I've never. Uh, yeah, they burned chips of wood, the maple, right. maple or the hardwood. They, then they, the smoke went uh, into the carburetor. Yeah, the gas from the. They made gas out of the wood, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of slow going. 
Yeah. You had to push the truck uphill sometimes. Oh yeah, the truck. Yeah, but this car, this tractor, they used on the wagon. They'd go and get supplies in the town whenever they could get some, and and uh, it was had the road gears to tra travel about like our tractors do. What about uh, the animals? Were they cows animals? Or? Animals. They had about seventy Holstein milk cows there. They had a milk machine. And where did all that stuff? Where did all the milk go? They shipped out someplace. It was all shipped out. You couldn't even steal milk. You couldn't. Mm -hmm. All the way steal once in a while, they odd guys and get larceny in your heart all the time. All the time. <laughs> 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 but you lived pretty good then, in one way. No, no. The yeah. food that the, the food the Germans gave you, uh, the bread was that hard black bread you've seen yeah. or sawdust. you know what I mean, the sawdust bread and and a week's ration was a piece of loaf about that long, and the loaf was about the size yeah. of our loaves. And about that long, that was a week's ration of bread. They were pretty tight then, aren't you? Well, that's all they had. What about your soup? What kind of soup do you have? The soup, the, the, the raw meat they gave you, was supposed, they're supposed to be in this chunk about that large each day. And you may got, maybe got once a week, one like that. And the same thing like cold meat. Uh, the cold meat uh, uh, made one good sandwich. That was a week's ration. So we had got so could supplement with our Red Cross parcels. You didn't gain much weight then? No. I weighed 130 pounds when I got home. How much did you weigh when you started out? Well, about 180. So I lost about... You lost 50 pounds over there somewhere. Yeah. yeah. What happened then when, uh, after you worked on that farm all that time, what happened to well, you then? The Russians in the meantime were advancing. From the... From, from the, the east from and the coming east, towards yeah. us. And uh, they were in Poland, I suppose. Could you hear the guns and see the yes, lights? Yes, later on we could. Yeah. What? Yeah. Uh, they moved us before we could hear the guns. Of course, they they decided they had to move us because they wanted to, didn't want to get captured by the Russians. So this, the army and they moved us. Uh, we walked towards our lines, and our lines at that time was in Denmark and way way oh, west. Yeah. Yeah. West would be, wouldn't it? Yeah. Way in the west, yeah. yeah. So we walked from, we started from Hammerstein and we walked, and I was liberated in Ludwigslust. That's about, according to my, my measurements, about 400 or 450 miles. You walked all that time? All that time, in the wintertime. Did you, did you run into any other uh, stalags where the men were walking, and, or were you well, uh, yeah, pretty well isolated there? The, the, uh, there were other stalags that joined, so there's a lot of people. There are about a couple of thousand people in that uh, walking. Walking, I guess. How in the world did you? What about eating and sleeping and well, water and so on? What happened in this when you get that many men walking out? No, I can't remember a, a, a thing that at the time that the Germans ever fed us, but but uh, they must have fed us sometime because they didn't have f food. And what they did, what they did do, they stopped on the farm. And they'd butch take an animal. If there was live, live animals, they'd take a, and they'd butch those animals right there and cook them made soup. The Germans would. The Germans would. For for themselves and for you. Yeah. And, uh, but it wasn't very often. But we had our Red Cross parcels that we, of course, they didn't last all that time, oh. but we started off in that farm. We, I don't know where they found the lumber, but the, we, the, we built a sled. Instead of carrying this stuff. That is from your camp going Going, uh, yeah, that's after we were going to, they started, started to move us. Started moving, yeah, yeah. towards the American line. Yeah. And this, this away from the Ger this away from the Russians. Yeah. Yeah. Away from the Russians. And uh, after about a week or so, we disbanded that sled because it was too heavy to pull, and there was a lot of stuff on there. Was there snow on the ground? Snow on the ground. What kind of shoes and things did you have? Well, what I still had my Army 8 inch boots. You did? Yeah. And I. Uh, I always took care of them and washed them and cleaned them, so they, I kept them pretty good. Pretty, mine were pretty, pretty decent compared to some. Some didn't have shoes. They just uh, had rags and on, and, and you walked in snow. It was, snow was about six to eight inches deep, and you had wet feet. And uh, I don't know how we made it, really, but we did. Did you ever get uh, sick or pneumonia or anything? Or? Well, I, I was walking. That's what we were carrying this pack, and this pack weighed about 70 pounds, I'd say. 
And I weighed 130 pounds, so you see. I didn't know what I weighed at that time, but I found out later after I got home, I weighed 130 pounds. And, and uh, it was tough to carry. And we were walking up a long hill. The snow was about six inches deep, I suppose. And feet were wet, and we had no overshoes. And I coughed up something. I coughed up blood, and I thought, Jesus, what a place to get TB, you know, here. Because I never run. Well, you wondered sometimes if you're ever going to make it, but yeah, you always thought that you were. You know, you never give up to decide I can't go any further. You just couldn't do that. You had to keep going. And we. Uh, How'd you make it up that hill then? We finally made it up that hill, and and it turned out that it was just the blood that came from strain because it disappeared and. I'm carrying that load and oh, I see. and walking that deep snow and we slept in barns and, and straw sheds and hay or straw barns they had no heat then no heat no no heat how do you, you never took off your clothes I don't suppose for very months often, not very time. often what you took your stockings off and wrapped them around your your waist and under your stomach so you could under your clothes so you could dry them you could wring the water out of them you know, and they were just wet. And the shaving, he didn't shave, except one time we did shave, and we busted the ice on a barrel that was standing under it. It caught rainwater, and, and the ice was about half an inch thick, I suppose. We busted that and used to wash and shave, and that stripped to the waist and washed in that water. Because we hadn't washed it. Well, you know what it would be. What about your clothes? What kind of clothes were you wearing on I that had, trip? I had uh, my GI clothes. There again, I had watched, uh, washed them and they taken care of them. They were wearing so. out pretty well. Yeah. They, they were tough, those ODs, pants, those woolen pants. Yeah. And we each had uh, two blankets that we had gotten through the Red Cross. So, no, we each had a blanket. So, uh, and you always bunked together, so, like in the old pup tents. We didn't have any tents, but we, uh, the barns were, just th those big sheds they had, they were good sized sheds because they had stacked their grain in there. And the, uh, on this farm we was on, where they were thrashing, they had a thrash machine, they fed it by hand. You fed it on top of the machine and you cut the bundle in half. And uh, everything was done by hand. And they had a third horsepower motor that pulled, electric motor that pulled the, the, the turned up machine. They could thrash about. 60, 70 sacks of grain a day, you know. Did you help them on that? Was that on your farm or did you? That was on the farm, yeah. yeah. What happened after you got through with this march? How far did you go? We walked to Ludwigslust, Germany. That's about, that's uh, north, uh, no, yeah, north, west of Berlin. About how far? Well, northeast of Berlin. I'd say about uh, 150 miles or 200 miles. We were up miles. in northern northern Germany then. Yeah, when we're south, you know, we were south uh, east of Hamburg. Oh, you oh, you went a long way. Yeah, I see. Yeah. You went a long way, then on that. It's a long way. Yeah. Stettin, you mentioned Stettin a while ago. And yeah. We walked through that town. That was yeah. kind of a harbor town, and and. Uh, that was bombed that night. We walked through at noon. They bombed it that night. We were about eight kilometers away, five miles away, and that's a yeah. ringside seat of the bombing. Those uh, British, you know, they used to bomb it at night, and the yeah. Americans used to bomb it in the daytime. Yeah. Now, uh, and then we were, then we were, we had a new Strolley or something's name. And this, uh, I can't remember the name of the towns exactly. It's about halfway between uh, Stettin and. And Ludwig's last where we were, we were stopped there for a while in, in the, on a farm there and worked on the farm and they were planting potatoes in the spring of the year. We started walking in in the middle of January and we walked, this was in March I suppose, and the climate there was, well it never got as cold there as here, but well that's neither here nor there. But anyway, we was on that farm for about oh, a couple of weeks, I think, during that time. And then we, then you could hear the 
our airplanes are starting to strafe. Our Thunderbirds and those airplanes were starting to strafe the people on the on the ditches on the roads. And they were uh, occupying those roads. They yeah, were trying to escape yeah. from the Russians. Yeah. And they uh, that 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 uh, farm was on there. That belonged to some officer, blame. And he was home for uh, on the furlough. He did a really beautiful. Uh, What's the name of a German popular car? It was like a two-seat. Mercedes Benz or? It's one like those, yeah. yeah. It's just like a two-seat uh, convertible. Oh, yeah. Touring car. Oh, yeah. Really nice and leather seats. And and this, his driver was polishing that car up. We were walking to Wittenberg. That's the Wittenberg for a while there. But when we was in that place for about two weeks, I think. And uh, and uh, he was polishing that thing up. And we were going back to the, to the barracks. And... The next day we come back and say, here was his car in the farmyard and it was just shot full of holes <laughs> when the strafe by our airplanes, you know. <laughs> and it was just shot of holes. The leather of leather post pure leather upholstery and it was just stripped like you took a sharp knife and just shredded it, you know. There's just nothing left of it. And uh Did they ever strafe the, you? Huh? Did they ever strafe you when you No. Uh, on that they, they recognized us. They did. Yeah, some of them recognized they were that close to the ground. They were planting potatoes. We thought, sure, they were going to... We had we had some uh, green scarf, some from the Airborne, had some identification, so they they were close enough so they could see this, and they tipped their wings and they did. flew away. And so they, didn't, they knew we were there, but they strafed the wagons on the, on the roads. And what about those uh, POWs? Many of them die on that long trip? I didn't see a die where I was, uh, but there were the frozen feet, and some were, some died because of exhaustion and cold and malnutrition. And they just left them there, I suppose. Well, they picked them up a wagon afterwards. Some went; they took to the hospital probably, and they were probably they were still. I never did see. I never did know what happened to some no. of those people. Then we. Then we, uh, at Ludwig's Lust, we were, got to Ludwig's Lust about, well, we was on this farm and we started walking again, and then that's when you could hear the artillery, the Russian artillery, and that's not very far away. And we was gonna, they were going to butcher an animal. In fact, they did, did butcher it, that animal, so they said, we're all going to eat off of that. They're all going to eat the same food. They had a big kettle there to throw this animal in, and we never got a chance to finish it because the, uh, the Russians were getting too close, and we left. That was the last day. Uh, that's, I was thinking a little bit next day or two after that, because uh, we'd walked for oh seventy-two hours at least. We'd walked there in the last stretch, and we were met up in Ludwig's last the eighty-second Airborne Division MPs. Can you imagine that? The Airborne MPs, is who were liberated us yeah. in Ludwig's last. Then we. What did they do with the guards then? The guards left you. The guards we had, they came. We came, saw them come through as people of other country. That's what they were. They weren't prisoners, were they? They were. They weren't like prisoners like we were. Who's that? The Germans. Oh yeah. And the civilians. Oh yeah. And this town of Ludwig lasts about twenty miles or twenty kilometers either direction. Uh, it was just packed with people, refugees and. That had come from Poland or they come, come from, from the east? Germany, yeah. Going west. Going west. They uh, were just packed with people. But we, so we got this, uh, we were trying to get, all we just had in mind is to get back to the USA, you know, yeah. quick as we could, see, but it didn't work that way. Uh, we, uh, We, we was looking for, we asked him where we could find a command post to get us off turned in, you know, and they said, well, they're all on the road, they're moving, they, you won't find anybody. So his MP said they, there were some jeeps there, standing there, three of them. A German jeep, we're going to land on water. And he said, take that in this, he said, take that in this, he said, I said. We took this and we, we'd seen a, they were pulling it, towing it behind or something, uh, because they didn't have gas to put in that, uh, Chrysler. Windsor Chrysler, four door sedan, black one. It really looked pretty, you know. And we was going back in line to see if we could find that thing. And said, take that Jeep and go look for it, see if you can find it. If you can find it, take it, you know. 
we didn't find it. And I, the Germans were had surrendered, and they were still armed yet. And and we went back in there about two, three kilometers. You could hardly move because it was a crowded. On the road. On the road, yeah. And uh, they threw Women, the Women, children, everything. Everything. Women, children, they had animals, and carts. animals. Well, the only animals they had were useful animals, so an oxen or a horse or a, somebody could pull something. And uh, the Germans threw rifles and guns right up in their jeep to us. We could have gone back and lunch and sold them for fifty dollars apiece, you know, if we'd known better. And uh, Germans were throwing their rifles. Yeah, the, yeah, because they jeep. were they were still the, the army had surrendered. Yeah, but they were in amongst the. Uh, Refugees, just like the civilians were. Yeah. And uh, anyway, they we came back and we couldn't find anything. So then they said, "Well, go pick, go pick." Uh, they were running the. They had one street for the civilians and one street for the servicemen or army to disarm them, and they threw the rifles up in a big pile and. And the uh, refugees went one direction and in one street, and they went. Uh, and uh, up on that line was a uh, uh, German vehicle. Was, they were ripping the wires out from under the dash to disable the vehicles, just so we couldn't use them, just like we were trained to do. And uh, uh, we took this German officer out of, kicked him out of the jeep, and him and his driver took his car. He wasn't going to let us, but we. Uh, he had no choice, so we <laughs> took it anyway. It was like a two-seater Jeep, I'd call it. And we got in that, and we drove that thing, and we drove it for about uh, almost a week, I think. You were in American territory. If yeah, were. yeah, we were in captured territory then, yeah. see. And here we come in this, this German vehicle, and we finally got some paint from my guy. He's painting his house, can you imagine? He's painting his house, and we got some paint to paint a POW on us so that he could recognize us. And, <laughs> Because the highways were just packed with vehicles, and our vehicles. I've never seen so many vehicles, because they were just advancing everywhere, you know. The Germans had surrendered then anyway. Were they going back towards the American lines then, or? Yeah. Yeah. And we finally got into this town, and, and uh, I don't remember what town it was, but they flew us for a while, and but we disbanded. We, we let an officer get a hold of that, that vehicle we had, you know. And I said to the guys, I think we made a mistake. We should never let go of that vehicle. We should have kept on going because when we wanted gas, we'd stop at a, and food, we stopped at a, it looked like it could be a mess hall or someplace that they were camping and at Bivouac area. We went in there and got food and, and gasoline. We got gas. They told us where you, if we told them where we come from. And one guy was hauling a, had a whole semi load of gas can, of gas, these tin, Five-gallon cans. Five Jerry square, can. five-gallon cans, yeah. And we asked him if he could, he said, we need gas. He said, we told him who we were. And he said, you all been in Germany all that time? He said, yeah. We asked if we could, if he, if we could have gas. Sure, he said, take the whole load. He said, I don't care. <laughs> so we got gas. That's what we did. We got, when we needed gas, we'd, we'd find somebody like that, or we'd find food. We'd stop at a, at a big whack area somewhere. And then we finally let go of that because we were told that they're going to put you on an airplane and ship you back to the States, you know. Shit, that didn't work that way. But anyway, we, we uh, you in this. you left that Jeep then? Where'd you go then? That's when we got into. American. Control. American control, yeah. yeah. We were people out of the country there for a while. Yeah. And we could have gone all the way to La Havre, France. We ended up in La Havre, France. They we went to Camp Lucky Strike, did you? Camp Lucky Strike. Yeah. That was in Lahore, France. And they flew, we flew, we flew in a C-47 for two, three hours. Their auxiliary gas tank was like the 260-gallon fuel tank you have for our stoves. That's oh. what their auxiliary gas tanks were. And uh, I can't remember what towns they were. Then they put us in a train. We got to France. And we put on a train. The first day, the, the French took, their, took over their railroad. But it went pretty good anyway, you know. We went through Paris. I remember seeing the Eiffel Tower, but you couldn't. It was a long ways away, but you could just barely see it. We ended up at Camp Lucky Strike. You know, they had three camps. They had Camp Lucky Strike, Camp Camel, 
Camp Chesterfield. Mm -hmm. But Lucky Strike was a big one. Yeah, that was a big one. I think they, when, I, when I was there, they said there were 75,000 people there. Yeah. I've never seen so many tents. And they had those uh, mess halls, you know, the lines and all the mess halls are about a lot, mile long. When you yeah. got through eating, you had to run to the end of the end of the line and get in line again. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh... How'd you get back from the Camp Lucky Strike then? Well, we laid there, we waited there for about two weeks, I think, for a ship. Yeah. And we got on the American Liberty ship and, uh, Went back to the States. It took us nine days to get back to the States. And you went through Camp Kilmer and uh, those places? Yeah. Back to uh, Fort Snelling and yeah. we got, got uh, your I, money and... I got a kick out of uh, how they separated you they, on the parade ground at, at Fort to Camp Kilmer, I guess it was. You went in Camp Kilmer, you were there about 24 hours, 48 hardly ever. 24 hours, you're gone again. Yeah. You got in, got in there. They interrogated you and they deloused you and you got clean clothes and. How well, did they deloused? We got those before. Yeah. We got those in Cap Lake Strike, but right. they deloused us again. Yeah. They had a bellow thing that you squeezed. They stuck it in your shirt here, <laughs> shot your powder all over. With that DDT. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh, everybody were full of powder. <laughs> the. Uh, uh, they lined you up under those, uh, under those banners, or? Yeah, they had signs of states. They had the North and South Dakota and Minnesota together, and there's anybody from those states go stand behind those signs. That's how they separated all these people. Because there was a lot of shit, a lot of troops, you know. Oh, and yeah. They, and we were still t on troop trains. Then and you went to right to, to Fort Snelling. Yeah, right to Fort Snelling. Yeah. Then they got the orders ready for you, and... and uh, he went right home and yeah, and then we got and furloughed. I would you got a six had a six day furlough. Do you have a six day yeah. furlough? Had a six day furlough and and uh, uh, and after that they sent you back to Hot Springs, Arkansas. Your orders read yeah. to convalesce for 15 days after that <laughs> wingy furlough. You know, there was a lot of beer drinking those those <laughs> 60 days at home and all and. Uh, I went back there, but I stayed there only, f then you got a physical again. I stayed there only three days, so five days maybe it was. I could stay there 15 if I wanted to, and then, yeah. but they were getting so crowded, so many people were coming back, and, and they, those who didn't want to stay, I had enough points to get out, and I was shipped to Camp Chef in Arkansas, I got discharged there. Then we went to the car there and drove back to Fargo. That's about the... Uh, End of that story. Then you got married and had kids. How many kids did you have? Six. Six kids. Three of each. Yeah, three of each. Living, you still live. You live in that Portland, I mean north of uh, Mayville there. North of Portland. Yeah, north of Portland. Yeah. Yeah. That junction. Yeah. Well, we skipped over a lot of things here. That. Uh, well, you can't go into all all no, the details. No, it too long. No. But that's good. I'm glad to hear that because. You know, that's a uh, characteristic of those prisoners of war. It's all this darn moving all the time, you know. Yeah. I know food and water, and you're moving and moving, and you stay one place, and then you're gone for marching another 30 miles, and it's uh, it's sort of an awful... Uh, you think back, you wonder how you made that, like, that long yeah. walk. I don't know how we made that. A lot of helter-skelter, kind of. I, I mean, just we, confusion. I don't know how we even could handle, could handle it, but yeah. we did. That was a long way. Well, the guys were young, see? Yeah. And then everyone was in the same boat. Yeah. And uh, it was, uh, I was surprised. The guys done pretty well. I mean, you know, their health stunk. Yeah. Hung in there. Some of them got sick, of course. Some died. Yeah. Quite, I don't know how many died. A lot of people died. Yeah. Well, they got died in these camps, you know, yeah. where they had all these diseases and yeah. junk, yeah. Well, thanks a lot. You did real well. Nice to hear your story. and. And uh, glad to see you're you're well, and healthy, and yeah. I had uh, two years ago. I had heart heart surgery, and, and yeah, in the Minneapolis uh, VA hospital. And Did that bother you any now, or pretty no, well? It's, no, it's getting better all the time. I think. Yeah, good. Working hard and getting rich. Yeah. yeah. Sure.
Like well, it, like thanks it. a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I bet so. Okay. Let us talk about that later. It's important, but love's greater. Right now, I'm busy as a bee. I'm in an awful hurry, so don't ask me now to stop. I'm gonna place an order in a little flower shop. Give me one dozen roses, put my heart in beside them, and send them to the one I love. He'll be glad to receive them, and I know he'll believe them. That's something we've been talking of. There may be orange blossoms later, kind of think that there will. Cause he's done something to me, and my heart just won't keep still. Give me one dozen roses, put my heart in beside them, and send them to the one I love. 